today is an extremely special day for me because I have to admit I've been looking forward to our event tonight. Um, Donald Ritchie's in the Inland Sea is obviously often um, is often spoken of as being one of the classic books on Japan, and I am very eager to join, to hear in, in the conversations of our wonderful guests tonight. But before we jump in there, this is a wonderful collaborative event that we were able to put on with Stonebridge Press, um, who was the publisher of, uh, current publisher of the uh, Inland Sea, and Peter Goodman of the Stonebridge Press is here with us. Uh, Peter has a personal connection also to Donald Ritchie, so I would be grateful, Peter, if you could give us a few words and start off our event tonight. Yes, uh, well, thank you very much, Yuko, and uh, thanks, of course, to the uh, Japan Society of Boston and to you, Yuko, of course, for uh, uh, helping set this up, and especially to, uh, to Peter Grilly for instigating this in the first place several months ago pointing out that it was the anniversary coming up and wouldn't it be a great thing to have such an event, uh, a look back. I mean, the, the book was published many years ago, but, you know, it's still uh, a very, very important work. And I just like to uh, say a couple of things as a, as a publisher of books about Japan, which uh, I suppose most of us know this, but books about Japan is kind of an industry unto itself. Um, there are books about, lots of books about Italy, lots of books about France, lots of books about England. I don't know if there are as many books about those countries as there are about Japan. And yeah. books about Japan still keep coming out. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, which uh, maybe people will go into later. But needless to say, of all the people who have written these many thousands of books about Japan, uh, Donald Ritchie stands at the very, very top of the pyramid, uh, not only because he was so prolific, but because of uh, the depth of his writing and the versatility of it and the number of fields that he wrote about. Um, today, as you know, we're talking about the Inland Sea, uh, probably his best known book. And uh, before I forget, I just want to mention if any of you who are watching this uh, presentation are inspired to go out and read Inland Sea and don't have a copy yet, or would like the latest copy, uh, it is available from the stonebridge.com website. You can get a discount by plugging in Inland Sea, that's the, uh, that's the code if you, if you go to it. And if you don't like uh, that, you can find it on Amazon, you can find it anywhere because the book is in wide distribution and there are even um, extant copies of the original book around. Uh, they might cost you some money, but they're definitely worth it because the printing back in the 1970s in Japan was bar none fantastic. And uh, I think Peter, you, you worked on that original book. So you know how wonderful it was. So from a publisher's perspective, just a, a very couple, few things about uh, Donald as a, uh, as a writer. He, he was really a, an easy guy to work with. He was very fast. He was reliable. He made his deadlines. He wasn't contentious. He absolutely knew the difference between art and commerce. So if you need to say, I need 750 words, that's what he would deliver. He wouldn't argue about money. In fact, he didn't often ask about money. We didn't really talk about money very, very much. And, uh, he worked really, you know, he wasn't, a, he wasn't a journalist. So if you read the Inland Sea, it's not like reportage. And it's, maybe it's not even a memoir. It's maybe something in between. I hope the other uh, people on the panel will, will talk a bit, a bit about that because I'm sort of fascinated about what's real and what's not real. Donald liked to shape his experience through his narrative in, in a way that only a, a really uh, a great writer does. So don't confuse him with being a journalist. And one thing about uh, Donald, of course, was that he had friends everywhere. I counted myself among his friends, uh, but everywhere. I mean, he just seemed to know everybody. And he was the go-to guy whenever he went to Tokyo. Well, the last times I saw Donald was after a book event here in the East Bay. Um, he was staying in a hotel in San Francisco. So I had to drive him back. It was about 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And... Uh, I said, well, Donald, uh, should I take you to the hotel? You know, where exactly is it? And he said, oh, no, 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 don't, don't bother. Just, just drop me off uh, somewhere on uh, Broadway and Columbus Avenue. And I said, what? Just drop you off? It's like, you know, 11 o'clock at night. It was, you know, one of those San Francisco nights. Streets were crowded. 
And uh, that's what I did. I dropped Donald off, and uh, I have no idea where he went. Uh, but presumably, he had a great adventure, and uh, everyone here is to talk about the great adventure that he had on the Inland Sea. So thanks very much for coming again, and uh, back to you, Yuko. Thank you so much, Peter. What a beautiful sort of anecdote uh, and a look, a little bit of a look into who Donald was. Thank you for that. Um, before I introduce my favorite moderator, Peter Grilly, I did want to tell all of you that chat is open. So let us know where you are joining us from. We always love to hear where you are joining us from. So let us know um, where, where are you right now? Um, also, because we are using the webinar format to tonight, um, please send in your Q&As or your questions, I'm sorry, Q&As, your questions through the Q&A little box that um, Zoom has at the bottom. Obviously, you can also send your questions through chat, um, but I will be, my staff and I will be looking at both Q&A and, um, and, uh, and the chat. So please send us your questions there. And with that said, I have the greatest honor of introducing you to Peter Grilly, like I said, who is one of my favorite um, speaker, moderator, and who will be moderating our talk tonight. Peter Grilly first encountered Japan in 1947 when he was five, and he has pretty much lived in Japan on and off for almost half of his life as a student, as an observer, as a writer, as a filmmaker, and also as a very active particip participant in the US-Japan cultural interactions. Peter was our president of the board, president of the Japan Society of Boston from 2000 to 2014, and he has a very strong and personal connection to Donald Ritchie and probably the best person, therefore, to be moderating our talk tonight. I would leave um, uh, Peter to introduce our special guest tonight. So Peter, the stage is all yours. Well, thank you, Yuko. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, I wanna say just in starting this, <clears throat> um, I woke up one morning about six or seven months ago and suddenly realized 2021 is exactly 50 years from 1971 when um, the Inland Sea was first published. 50 years, that's half a century, and I thought we shouldn't let this anniversary go by unnoticed. So I called Peter Goodman, whom you just spoke with, <clears throat> whom you just heard from, and we thought we should put together some kind of commemoration of the 50th anniversary of this wonderful, uh, wonderful book. For me, um, it's an extremely significant book for so many reasons, which will come out in the course of our conversation. But first of all, it was the very, very first manuscript that I ever worked on as an editor. I had just finished grad school or left grad school, I should say, was living in Tokyo, got my first real job after school at the publishing company Weatherhill in Tokyo, which was a very interesting, very unusual American company that published books on Japan. And I was hired as a junior editor. And the first or second day that after walking into the office to begin this new job, I was given the manuscript of a book called The Inland Sea by a person whom I'd known already for many, many years, Donald Ritchie, and said, take a look at it, I was told, take a look at it, which I did. And then I realized that I was maybe the 10th or 12th or 15th person to work on this manuscript. Um, well, to make a long story short, the book was, manuscript was published. It didn't need much work from me, certainly, on it as a very fledgling editor. Um, but it was published several months later in the fall of uh, 1971. And here we are, 50 years later, celebrating a book that has never gone out of print, is considered a great classic on Japan, um, in, in so many ways, which I'm sure we'll touch on in our conversation. I'm so happy this evening to be joined by two good friends, one of whom knew Donald Ritchie, the other uh, knew him very slightly, not as long as, as I did, uh, but comes uh, to this conversation in a much more objective way as a writer himself on Japan, that's Roland Kelts, 
a very special writer on Japan and will be thinking and talking about Donald, I think, from the perspective of a writer, not so much as a personal friend. The other speaker this evening is uh, my great senpai from Harvard. Uh, he was a couple of years ahead of me at Harvard, John Nathan, who is known throughout the world as one of the great experts and fabulous translators of modern Japanese literature, contemporary Japanese literature, um, principally as the translator of Oe Kenzaburo's novels and was with Oe when Oe won the Nobel Prize several years ago. Uh, but John is also known for his translations of, of Yukio Mishima and his great biography of Mishima. So it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to have John, uh, John Nathan with us uh, together with Roland Kelts. I thought the best way or a good way to start off this program this evening is to show you some pictures before we start speaking about the book, The Inland Sea, some pictures of Donald um, as he looked through various points of his long career in, in Japan. So let me turn on the screen share. Donald Ritchie uh, first came to Japan in 1947, two years after the end of the war. And he said on many occasions that his life really began in 1947 when he was uh, 24, 25 years old. Um, he didn't really think of Lima, Ohio as part of, significant part of his life. Life began when he was 24, when he came to Japan in 1947. He arrived on January 1st, New Year's Day, 1947. And here's Donald um, a year before he died in, uh, this picture was 2012. He died in February of the next year, um, having spent 65 years in, in Japan and was known throughout the world by then as the foremost observer, writer, commentator on on Japan. Um, here's Donald in 1947 or 48 in Asakusa. Um, and here he is about the same time on the left, he's in Kamakura and on the right in Nihonbashi in Tokyo. And Donald, when he arrived January 1st, 1947, almost immediately had his pen and pencil and notebook. <laughs> notes, observing, wandering the streets, meeting people, uh, and writing about this country, Japan, that he had landed in as a young serviceman. Um, one of the very, very earliest pieces that he wrote was uh, a short essay about uh, the man who later went on to win the Nobel Prize, Yasunari Kawabata, the great novelist Kawabata whom Donald met on the top of a building, a skyscraper that was still standing in Asakusa. And uh, if you're familiar with his writings of Japan portraits and his journals, that essay about Kawabata looking out over the streets of this utterly destroyed city, uh, which Kawabata loved, of course, um, it was one of the finest pieces that Donald wrote virtually in the first week or first month that he was living in, in Tokyo. Um, here he is around 1949, 1950. He was first employed as a typist at the Stars and Stripes, Pacific Stars and Stripes newspaper. And this is about the time when I first met him. He became a friend of my parents and was often at our house um, for, for meals, Sunday, Sunday dinners. And I'll never forget one occasion on a Sunday afternoon when he decided that we were all gonna do a dramatic reading of The Tempest. Now I was eight or nine, maybe eight at the time. And um, suddenly I was reading parts of The Tempest with Donald Ritchie, who of course, as was his habit, he took all the best parts. It was an unforgettable afternoon. Um, Donald, from his very first days in Tokyo, made a point of meeting all the most interesting people he could discover, 
writers, artists, um, especially film directors because of his passion for films. So on the, on the top, the left picture is him, I think in 1948 with uh, the novelist Kawabata, whom I just mentioned. Um, the other pictures are of him with uh, Kurosawa um, on, this, on the open set of uh, Throne of Blood, which was being filmed. And Donald was working on then on a book about the Japanese cinema. Um, in the bottom right corner is uh, Donald with uh, Ozu, the other great Japanese uh, director whom he, um, whom he wrote about extensively, whom he introduced to the world, really. And in the other picture on the bottom is Mr. and Mrs. Kawakita, a great Japanese film producer, and his wife, who were the people most instrumental in introducing Donald uh, to the film community in Japan. Um, and that led to three really very special books, which I hope everyone listening um, either owns or knows about or has read. First, the Japanese film, Art and Industry, which he wrote with Joseph Anderson in 57, 58. It was published in 1959. And then five years later uh, was his great biography and study of the films of Akira Kurosawa. And then finally in the middle 70s, 70, 74, is his book on Ozu, uh, Yasujiro Ozu. Um, but in addition to these three great works on Japanese cinema were many, many, many other books that Donald wrote um, about Japanese cinema, not only Japanese cinema. It is, um, he did a book on George Stevens, um, which grew out of a retrospective on George Stevens films at the Museum of Modern Art in uh, the mid fifties. So, and here's just a sampling of uh, the many works that Donald wrote about the Japanese film. And in addition to film, he wrote about just about every other conceivable subject of uh, having to do with Japan. He, he, Donald published in his lifetime more than 50 books on Japan, um, including novels, The Scorching Earth, The Companions of the Holiday were two of his works of fiction. Kumagai was another of his novels, but then many, many works introducing Japan, writing about the Japanese tattoo, portraits of various individuals that he met in his extremely active and interesting life. Here's another selection of, of uh, Donald's writings on Japan. And the great sort of summing up uh, were, came in these two books um, toward the end of his life, the uh, the Donald Ritchie Reader, which is selections from his writing of his whole career, published around 2001, I believe, and then J the Japan Journals of Donald Ritchie, uh, which were excerpts of his writing beginning in 1947, as I said, and going right up until his uh, the end of his life. A marvelous collection of, of excerpts from his journals um, edited by Lisa Lowitz. Um, and in addition to all the writing, he was also making films of his own. He made about 30 short films, beginning with one as a teenager that he did when he was still in Lima, Ohio, um, about Sunday morning in, in the suburbs, I think is the title of it, uh, eight millimeter, very early, very youthful film, and then 20 some additional films um, made in Japan, which have been collected in this anthology of uh, six or seven of his films. And in addition to writing and making films himself, he was constantly traveling around the world. He was, he was giving lectures throughout his life. The top picture on the left, there's a, a picture of him giving a talk at the Harvard Film Archive. Uh, he was invited to film festivals all over the world. And the black and white picture is me and Donald at the Hawaii Film Festival around 1990, I think, um, and was constantly being interviewed. Um, National Public Radio, PBS, was constantly going to him for uh, commentary about Japan. The Japanese press interviewed him often. 
Um, so Donald was a very, very busy, active person throughout his life. He was also a painter. There's a picture of him as one of his exhibitions. But most of all, he liked to be in his small apartment in Tokyo writing at his desk writing, which is what we're so grateful to him for, for his uh, lifetime of writing about, about Japan. Here, here is the picture again of him just before he died, several months before he died, when he was still being interviewed by journalists who, every journalist who arrived in Tokyo, one of the first people he had to meet was Donald Ritchie to find out what this country was, was all about. And if you were lucky enough to be interviewing him or, or visiting him uh, in that tiny apartment in Ueno, and it was a pleasant weather outside, you would have the great good fortune to sit on his tiny balcony looking out over this magnificent view that he had um, of Ueno's Shinobazu Pond. Um, but today we're here to talk about the Inland Sea. And I just wanted to show several of the different editions that this book has gone through since it first was published in 1971. The, the picture at the upper left is the first edition, the one that I, that I worked on. And Stonebridge Press, thank you Stonebridge Press for, for republishing virtually the same uh, format as the very first edition. The large picture on the right is of Stonebridge's newest um, edition of the Inland Press, which brought back the wonderful photographs by Midori Kawa, whose pictures were featured in Donald's first, uh, the first publication of the book. And then in 1991, uh, Lucille Cara, who I think may be with us this evening, <clears throat> made a film documentary of the Inland Sea. And uh, Criterion Collection now has it, has remastered it, and uh, is distributed in a beautiful uh, Blu-ray edition with wonderfully remastered sound. So I thought I would end this introduction with just an excerpt from the film where you hear, hear Donald speaking. So this is the Inland Sea uh, film documentary. When uh, the people who made this film came to me and asked about mm -hmm. making the film, I was very surprised because I've written a number of books that would make excellent films. Nobody ever asked me about them. But uh, this film, it never occurred to me that this film could be a book. For one thing, it's a novel in the shape of a journal. How do you do that? And so I was against it until I, I was further tempted by being told that I could write the script myself. And that took a very long time, actually, because it, I had to find out how to do this. It seemed absolutely beside the point. I thought I'd already done what I wanted to do to make another kind of version. I, it seemed sort of kitschy, you know, like fake wood, painted like marble or something. So I wanted to avoid this, but I was interested in the process because it's a very interesting aesthetic process. And so eventually I turned and I finished up with more or less the film as you see it. I wanted to make a sort of a parallel structure. The Inland Sea here and then the Inland Sea film here. The, 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 shape, the same shapes are mirroring each other. So in this way, I hope to emblemize the experience and to make it real and palpable and to make you feel as though you'd been on the end of the sea yourself and that I had somehow or other helped you to be there. The Seaborn Pilgrim is welcomed and it's full. Just by turning west and south away from Tokyo, away from the snowbound province of Ohio, I could continue forever following the summer sun. So um, I think I have to end this. Oops. There we are. <clears throat> so now having given you just a brief hint of what the book, this marvelous book and the beautiful film version of it are, uh, let's open the conversation and start talking about it with, 
with John Nathan and Roland Kelps. Um, my, my first question to my friends here is, um, what is the book really? Many people have called it a travelogue and it certainly is a marvelous um, journal of traveling through the Inland Sea. But Donald, as you just heard, says it's a novel. So let's talk a little bit about what what you think this book really, really is. Is it fiction? Is it nonfiction? Is it a travelogue? Is it a novel? Uh, may I jump in here? Sure. Um, I was interested when Peter mentioned a, a sort of question about uh, the veridicity of this thing. How, how real was it? How imagined was it? And I think that's a, that's a very interesting question. You know, one of my favorite Henry James quotes is, the historian essentially needs more documents, wants more documents than he can use. The fabulist, meaning people like Donald, want more liberties than they can take, which I've always uh, used as a kind of mantra in some of my own work. And I, when I recently reread this for the first time in decades, um, well, the first time I read it, I hadn't read Proust. This time I'd read Proust twice. And I was reading along and all of a sudden, I found myself in Baalbek, unmistakably. You know, this famous fictional beach that Proust wrote about in volume two of uh, his great epic work um, about these young women. Uh, and uh, I was reading Proust basically in, through Donald's uh, lens. You know, this is the, this, this wonderful episode where he encounters a group of young girls, 14, 15 years old, uh, very innocent, but very uh, somehow uh, exciting at the same time. And he strikes up a sort of a relationship with the, a 15 year old. And if you read this, I mean, those of you who have the book or something or might come back to it, I, I just wanted to call your attention to this. It starts on page 97. It's on the island of Nadeshima. Um, and this is all of a sudden you're, you're, you're in the, the second volume of Proust in the shadow of young girls in flower. And he meets these innocent, nonetheless lascivious young women. And, and one in particular, who's both naive and provocative, exactly as Albertine, you remember possibly, the 15 year old in Proust who haunts him all through. And Donald is taking some liberties. You know, all of a sudden he's sort of, we're not sure what he's doing. He's, stroking her hand, he's nuzzling her a little bit. He writes this in a very sort of refined, proper way, but underneath it is some fairly raunchy stuff. It is a kind of a prurient sensibility at work. And you can just tell that Donald is really very taken with this 15 year old girl. And we don't really know, did this really happen? I personally am somewhat sure that a lot of this is invented. I mean, it's, it can't be just a coincidence of an objective observer to find this group and this girl in a beach setting, exactly tonally speaking, uh, what you see in Proust. And of course, Proust was very important to Donald throughout his life. Um, you know, you can find illusions in much of what he writes in his marvelous sort of sardonic, you know, Donald had a way of being both proper and supercilious at the same time. He was very good at that. And he would describe a family and say, you know, these people are wonderful. They're just like the Verdurin uh, in Proust. The Verdurin are famous sort of social climbers in Proust. So he both puts them up and puts them down at the same time, which is one of his hallmark approaches, I think, to people. So to me, as you read along, this doubt begins to arise. You know, how much of this is, uh, is actual uh, mirroring of an experience and how much of it is invention. And I obviously, I don't know, but it leads me to characterize the book, certainly not as a travelogue. And I don't really think it's a novel either because it doesn't have a dramatic arc that I can find, which a novel needs. So to me, it's, it's kind of a memoir, really, very much an experience of Donald Ritchie's moving through this place that he loves. And if you read it, you know, you, you do see constantly something he does. And I use the word super, he meets people and he's at once genuine and ingenuous about them. And he's, he's, 
sincere and he's empathetic. And at the same time, he's goofing on them. And he does that, you know, he, he was an old fellow and yes, isn't he charming? And what did he tell us? Well, he told us something sort of silly, didn't he? But it was interesting and, and it goes on that way. So Donald was always bringing people in and then holding them apart at a distance in order to appreciate them better possibly. So to me, Travelog cum memoir with certainly fictional aspects, because many memoirs, the best memoirs, tend to be fabulized in some way or other. So it's a kind of an inventive memoir travelogue, in my point. Well, I think, uh, and you can say this about many of the, Donald's other books, as well as Ian Lancy, but especially Ian Lancy, Donald was always writing about himself, really. He was writing about Japan, of course, but he wasn't writing as a journalist might write. It, he was writing objectively, but he was always so much at the center of whatever he was writing about. So you're, with all of his writing, almost all of his writing, you're sort of discovering, you're on a journey to discover Donald Ritchie in Japan. It's one of the things that I love most, most about, about him. Well, like any really good writer, he was, of course, a narcissist. Yeah. And uh, the, when I first met Donald, which was shortly after I came to Tokyo, in, uh, I was 22, and I was staying um, at the YMCA in Awajicho. Don't ask me how I ended up there. I don't know. And I, and, and, and I don't know if you've ever been there, Peter, before that place was destroyed, but they would serve real meals in the dining room and Coca-Cola and real Coca-Cola bottles and so on. And living down the hall from my room in the YMCA was a cameraman named Cliff Harrington. This was some guy who'd been a news cameraman. And I got to know him a little bit. And one day he said to me, you know, I'm going out today. It's a Sunday. I'm going to shoot some movies with this guy, Donald Ritchie. You want to come and watch? And so I, of course, I said, I, yes, I would like to. And he led me out into the streets of Tokyo. And there was Donald and Mary Evans, his then wife. And Cliff was the, was the DP. And Donald was running around, you know, making these extraordinarily raunchy um, films that were, you know, gay and, and SM and all kinds of stuff that he would throw in. And he was very excited. And I thought, this is an, a fantastic character. I could see because he was directing and he was flamboyant. And, and I was very attracted. I, 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 he was so appealing. And so somehow I managed to to, you know, to strike up a conversation and to meet him and to follow him around as he made this movie. And I'll just, I don't want to, I'll, I'll jump way forward when he was acting miserably as the curator of film at the Museum of Modern Art. He was forced to live in New York for a couple of years and hated it, as you remember. And he had this amazing apartment that looked out on St. Patrick. And one day I went with Donald to a screening of Donald Ritchie's films in the, uh, extraordinarily stuffy environs of the Museum of Modern Art. And there were all these fancy museum curators and everything sitting around the lights came down and there on the screen appeared this fairly raunchy stuff, pretty extreme. And it went on for several short movies and there was sound. Then the lights came up and there was absolute silence. I mean, most of the audience were white in the face a few were flushed. Those who had discovered themselves in the movie were a little flushed. And Donald, I'll never forget this, he took a cigarette holder, you know, with these long, out of his pocket, and he fitted a cigarette to it, and he lit up, and he just sat there, and he was perfectly calm. And obviously, the farthest thing from apologetic saying, well, what are we here? What are they going to say? Everybody else was just very freaked out. And, but Donald remained totally Donald in the midst of this commotion, you know, that he created. Well, I, as I said earlier, I first met Donald when I was six years old or seven years old, and I didn't have the slightest notion then of any difference between fiction and nonfiction, uh, between uh, objectivity and subjectivity, between transgressive and non-transgressive. And the, all, those were all things that I, discovered as I grew older, mainly thanks to Donald. I mean, he taught me all of these things or just sort of being in his aura. You learned um, about this character that as John so wonderfully just described him. Um, Roland, how did you first meet Donald and what was your personal 
connection with him. Thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, I just want to um, say how uh, privileged and honored I am to be a small part of this event. Um, I've learned so much from both John Nathan, all of his translations, his writing, his filmmaking. Um, John Nathan is legendary. And I've learned so much from my dear friend, Peter Grilly, who's equally legendary for the work he's done between Japan and the US uh, over, over decades. So it's a real honor and a privilege. And I'm, I'm, I'm very, very humbled by being a part of this and let alone being a part of a discussion about Donald Ritchie, who was, um, I think it's safe to say when I got to Japan as an adult, he was like the Parthenon. I kind of avoided him uh, deliberately because he got there way before me and he wrote some beautiful English language books about Japan. And what was I gonna tell him? I was kind of like, oh, there he is, Donald Ritchie. There he is, he's still here. And he was a man about town. And I should give a shout out, another shout out to Lisa Lowitz, who I think was the first person who introduced me to Donald at um, one of those uh, book receptions at the International House in Roppongi. It was a very brief introduction and Donald was very pleasant and polite, but had no idea who I was or why he should know me. Um, later, I was really fortunate to be invited to give a reading on a, a bill with Donald Ritchie at a small cafe in Takata um, This would have been around 2007, 2008. And I had just published a book called Japan America. So I couldn't believe they were asking me to be on the bill with Donald Ritchie. And he was incredibly gracious. He told me he learned a lot about anime, which he said he didn't watch at all. Um, and uh, learned something about manga. And then he sat, he read first and he sat in the front row. And I think he fell asleep in about 10 minutes after I started reading. Um, <laughs> A humbling experience. And I was just grateful that he woke up when I finished um, and, and said some equally nice things to me before he hopped in a taxi and, and left. Um, so I'm, I'm humbled and I'm honored to be here. And what I can add is nothing like what John and Peter know about the man, Donald Ritchie. As Peter mentioned, I may be able to come at this as a writer who learned a lot, who has continues to learn a lot from his um, craft and from his uh, brilliance and particularly in the Inland Sea. And I would also recommend the Japan journals, which uh, Lisa Lowitz edited. They're just, they're stunning. And if you care about Japan at all, actually, if you care about writing about different countries, those two books are really special and will teach you a lot. Well, when, one especially, especially in the Japan journals, you get a sense of this incredible combination of personality traits of this man. I, I used the word transgressive earlier, um, which is a pretty tough, some people would say a very nasty uh, word, but in his, in his, some of his writings and in his films, transgression is certainly there. And at the same time, as Roland, as you just mentioned, he was extraordinarily polite. And I couldn't, I could never quite put together the pieces of this person who on the one hand would go around insulting everybody in the room, um, yeah. but do it so with such politeness and such politesse. And uh, I asked his sister, whom I got to know uh, very late in Donald's life, um, about that once and she, all she could account for it was, yes, well, we were very well brought up. We were <laughs> very well brought up. And Donald was very well brought up. And he wrote very proper thank you notes every time he came to dinner. I mean, there was this sense of great personality and respect for the other people around him. And at the same time, a talent for forcing them to see things that they didn't want to look at. And um, which some people considered very insulting. I never thought it was insulting, but uh, I know many people did. He hurt a lot of feelings, for sure, in the course of his life, because he was, you know, unapologetic about seeing it as he saw it and expressing what he saw. Um, but that was part of his, his deal. Well, I would just add, I mean, I think as... <clears throat> As uh, Peter, as you and, and John, as you know better than I do, the, the best writers, the best filmmakers, the best 
directors tend to be tricksters, that old character from, from fairy tales. They tend to be the ones who tweak the ears, who twist the conventions, and tricksters have to get by uh, in civil society, you know? So you have to find a way to, uh, to be polite and to present yourself publicly while in your work, you, 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 you tweak the ears and you, you, you pinch the, uh, the legs, you know, you have, to, you have to get by and you have to get paid. You have to pay your gas bill. So. a great French phrase, épaté le, bo le bourgeoisie. I mean, that's what Donald really loved doing was provoking conventions, provoking the bourgeoisie and uh, forcing them. He was incredibly honest, I think. Oh and, yeah, that, that's, that's, yeah, I wanted to, and before I forget, also big thanks to Yuka Honda and Japan Society of Boston for hosting this event. Really great of you guys to do this and great of Stonebridge, Stonebridge Press to support it as well with the books. But very, very quickly, um, you asked Peter at the start what kind of book it is. And um, I was saying the other night to a friend of mine that it, it's reminiscent to me of another English language book I love a lot which was published in 1987, I think, by V.S. Naipaul, another guy who was uh, who offended a lot of people and uh, tweaked a lot of noses. Uh, but he wrote a book in 1987, 1988 called The Enigma of Arrival. And I don't know if any of you have read it, but it reminds me, or the Inland Sea reminds me of Enigma of Arrival and back and forth. When Enigma of Arrival came out, which is basically very much based on B.S. Naipaul's autobiography, but uh, his time living in Salisbury, England, and watching a, a man die, uh, an English farmer die. It's pretty much the whole book, except his brother dies while he's writing it. But when it came out in England, I lived in London at the time, and they called it a memoir come autobiography. They didn't know what to call it. I think it was Penguin in the UK. When it came out in the US from Knopf, it was called a novel. And I remember laughing that these publishers were so stuck on their categories and on which shelf it should go into in the bookstore that just across the Atlantic, two different austere and legacy publishers called it a different kind of book. So to me, in a way, one of the joys of reading Inland Sea, and I've now read it uh, three times, is that it is uncategorized categorize categorical you can't name what the category is i think as john said it doesn't have the narrative arc and the sort of you know doesn't stand up to genev or or to dostoevsky in terms of what we think of as a novel on the other hand it doesn't seem like pure memoir that passage john cited is just amazing and funny and strange and off the wall there are passages in the book one of the things I admire as a writer is the way Donald switches almost seamlessly between present and past tense. It feels like a memoir. He's looking back. I took this trip to the Inland Sea and then suddenly he's talking to Saburo and it's present tense. He looks at me. He stood up. He stands up in the doorway. It's like, wait, how, how did we get here? Some of the dialogue reads like a play. It reads like he's writing for the stage. Like these, and you think, all right, he's also going from Japanese to English. So how much of this is what Saburo really said? And how much of it is Donald tweaking the English so it sounds funky, it sounds a little suggestive, it sounds sometimes vaguely erotic. Uh, you know, where is Donald coming in and tweaking the English so that it sounds more sensual? than what it might sound like. And, and John, you know a lot more about this than I do as a, as a literary translator, but you know, you know what I mean? Some of the dialogue you think, wait, was it really said that way? Right. I, I have a question that you've just reminded me of, Roland, and I think Peter really probably could answer this for me. What was your sense of how much Japanese Donald really spoke? I know that he didn't read any, really. But was, I asked the question because, you know, all through the years, uh, I always had the sense that Donald only went so far and then sort of stopped acquiring Japanese. What, what was yours? Because this relates to what Roland was talking about in terms of how he's handling dialogue. In the Inland Sea, he says, 
This time I understood a little more or I understood a little less. Of course, these people are speaking in dialect, many of them on the islands. And so what was your sense of his command? I think his command of the spoken language was excellent. He spoke, he spoke very well. Um, and he spoke very well at all sorts of different levels. He probably was least good in the polite, politer forms of Japanese in Keigo. But for straight spoken, conversational, colloquial Japanese, he was very good. He never learned to read. And I think that was always, it troubled him in some ways that he couldn't read. But even though it troubled him, he sort of put it aside and thought, I'm never going to be able to learn to read this language. So to hell with it. I'm not going to bother. But he did, he Good did, decision, he, he did speak, he did speak very well. And he, as you, as you all know, he did an enormous amount of subtitling of Japanese films. Right. Now, he would be given, the producers would give him, the, the director would give him the script, the written script, and say, translate it, translate it, give us subtitles. And that's the one thing that he couldn't do because he couldn't read the script. So he would sit in the movies usually, or on video, with a Japanese friend. There was always a Japanese friend at his side. And Donald would understand most of the spoken dialogue, but what he didn't understand some nuance, he would turn to the friend and the friend would explain it to him. But it was always through this verbal um, format that he was doing his translation of films. He didn't, he didn't translate poetry, he didn't translate novels, he didn't translate the written word, but he did the translation of films because it was a, a verbal, um, um, a verbal thing, not a not a written thing, and he would always do it in collaboration with a very close friend who could tell him what what they really meant or what they pretended they were meaning. So he he could capture the nuances, which I think he did much better than many more recent translators of Japanese dial, um, film subtitles. Um, but you're right; he never learned to read. And while this may have been a problem for him, um, it was one that he could ignore. Something else you said, Peter, in your presentation that struck me forcibly was that you remembered an afternoon when Donald sort of uh, directed and took the best parts for himself from The Tempest. Yes. And that let me think, and I've said this, I think we mentioned this the last time, you know, many Asianists, across the board, know a lot about Japan or China or whatever, but know very, very little, turns out, about Western culture and literature and art and music and all these things, which is why I think I, I, I told you that Kenzaburo Oe embarrassed me a lot when one day he turned to me and said, well, why is it that you guys that write about Japanese literature don't know anything about Western literature? Is, you know, that was exaggerated, a little mean, but it nonetheless knocked me back. And it is true of many of us that we really are so, you know, it takes so long to learn these languages or what, for whatever explanation. Donald was, was, was an extraordinarily well-read, well-listened, acutely cultured guy coming out of his own culture before he ever got to Japan. And that underruns what he does like a great river beneath the surface. You know, I mean, he knows exactly all what, what he's talking about. He's a very sophisticated Western thinker and writer before he even approaches Japan, and he's able to use that, which I think distinguishes him um, from the black. I don't general. know whether it was. I don't know whether it was. You're you're absolutely right. His erudition was extraordinary, uh, but I don't know whether it was before he ever approached Japan. Um, he he came to Japan when he was twenty three or twenty four, okay, well. um, but he was constantly reading and constantly listening to music. So he was, in a sense, he was constantly studying and he was learning. He wasn't always reading about Japan by any means. He was writing about Japan, but he wasn't reading about Japan. He was reading Jane Austen and he was reading um, uh, Pico della Mirandola. He was reading everything about Western uh, civilization, Western music. You're, you're absolutely right. And he tended in music, especially in he, he, he would have great arguments with my father, who was a music critic about this, because Donald would always go for the most sort of obscure 
um, etude by Debussy or by <laughs> yeah. that no one ever heard of before that no one ever performed, but Donald knew about it. And that's what he wanted to listen to. And my father would say, but what about Tchaikovsky? And what about the, um, what about the popular, what about La Mer of Debussy, which is super popular? No, 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 Donald would say, no, no, I want to, I want to hear this very obscure etude. And partially, Partly, it may have been because it was obscure that he was interested in it. Um, but you're right, his knowledge of music was was incredible. Um, I, Toru Takemitsu, the, the great Japanese composer, was also a very good friend of mine. And I would watch the two of them together talking about music. And it was on a stratospheric level of sophistication. Um, it, it, it was amazing. And, you know, when he, when he came to our house for these um, readings of Shakespeare and whatnot, it wasn't just Shakespeare. One, one week it might be The Tempest, the next week it would be a, a novel by, by Jane Austen, who was another one of his favorite writers. But he was constantly reading, constantly studying, constantly improving himself. Um, and that leads me to sort of wonder about how he managed to survive so happily and so long and so well in Japan, where 90% of the people that he encountered didn't know any of this stuff, didn't. Well, you know, I, if I might interject for a second, um, first of all, I want to um, <clears throat> really firmly back what John's saying. Uh, going back to the Inland Sea recently, I've read it now three times. The first time I read it, I was pretty young. I thought it was a bit fuddy-duddy and I thought it was mannered. And I thought uh, he's really, you know, he mentions the Keitai Denwa so late. And it's like, what, what is this guy? He's, he's, he's out of the loop. Second time I read it, I admired the prose more and how he manipulated the voice, the present and past tense, as I was saying a minute ago. And more recently, uh, what John just said, his erudition, he, know, he knows his Shakespeare, he knows his Dryden, he knows his Follet, he knows his Mozart, uh, he knows his Jane Austen. He knows I mean, his Proust. Oh, he knows his Proust, of course, as you, as you elucidated very, very well. And that really lends this book in particular, Inland Sea, an incredible weight that so few books about Japan and, and the ones I've read about China really carry. And, you know, I'm the kind of person, I get a lot of, unfortunately, too many books about Japanese pop culture that cross my desk asking for blurbs or reviews and so on. And one thing you notice about, especially a lot of American, mostly boys who write about Japanese pop culture is they know everything that was released since 1960 and they know their Tezuka and they know their Miyazaki and they know their Tomino. But what they don't know is that all of those guys read Shakespeare. They studied French literature. They studied uh, philosophy from Europe. The guys who really created and, and some women who really created Japanese pop culture, they knew Western culture to the roots. And the oddly enough, or sadly enough, the a lot of the American fans who write about Japanese pop culture now act as if it, you know, just sprang from the foreheads of these uh, brilliant Japanese creators. And this is taking nothing away from Japanese artists, but as Donald Ritchie knew there were people in Tokyo, there were artists, there were people who knew these roots. He has a wonderful passage about the Kisaten, the Japanese coffee house, where he describes how every, you know, the latest issue of the Partisan Review is sitting, sitting next to the latest issue of Vogue. And he describes it as this sort of weird cubist Western influence that it's not actually hierarchical, it's not that well organized, but if you go to a kisaten and you get your cup of, of brew and your, your pizza toast, well now it, was pizza, it wasn't pizza toast back then, but you get your piece of thick toast and you sit there in the cafe smoking, you're gonna be able to read all these magazines from Western culture and you can absorb and you can acquire what you like what works 
in Japanese culture. And I think that rereading the Inland Sea uh, recently, I thought Donald's erudition really, really gives this book ballast. It, it really gives it a weight that so many books I read today, unfortunately, about Japan and Japanese pop culture and Japanese contemporary culture just don't carry because, as John said, the American authors, they don't know Homer. <laughs> they haven't read Shakespeare. They don't know Bach. It's weird because these guys are writing about Japanese pop culture as if it just emerged, you know, in this geyser. And it's like, wait a minute, guys, you don't know your own culture. You don't know your Western antecedents. I think in a really interesting and maybe unique way, Donald, Donald was certainly drawn to other Japanese intellectuals. He didn't like Inteddy, but he deeply mm. appreciated someone like Takemitsu who knew Western music backwards and forwards, or a writer like Mishima, for example, who knew what he was talking about when he was uh, talking about Western, Western writers, even very, very obscure ones. But Donald was able to enjoy his company with those people, e equally erudite or almost equally erudite as he was, and also with street people with people that he would pick up, people that he would go to bed with, people who had no book learning at all, but were real, authentic Japanese people that he was, he felt a compassion, he felt an interest, he felt whatever he felt, he was equally at home with them. And I don't know many non-Japanese in Japan who can sort of make that arc, make those transitions between so many different levels of intellect and, and, and um, erudition. Peter, do you know, you know, you, 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 uh, as you talk, I'm just thinking about Mishima Yukio and Donald Ritchie, which is to me is fascinating at this moment. I'm, I'm really curious. I mean, they're both, there, there was a certain similarity about them they were both nasty pieces of work in a way. That is to say, <laughs> they, were, they were reflexively sardonic, removed guys. And, you know, the kind of standard Japanese earnestness would fall on Mishima and he would turn it into, you know, if you think of a story like the, the 10,000 yen cookie and stuff like that. I mean, he was always looking through this kind of, genuine Japanese, I'll, I'll call it goody two-shoe and, you know, <laughs> earnestness and slashing it to ribbons. And so, in his way, was Donald. You know, there's a lot of Truman Capote in Donald, surely. And so I wondered, these two guys, I, in my own life, I, I'm not aware of them having had much of a connection, did they? They were very good friends. They were very good friends. And I think I didn't know Mishima well at all, um, certainly not as well as you did, John, but I had a sense that Mishima, when he wanted to be able to talk about Wordsworth or whatever, some um, aspect of Western civilization, Western culture, he would gravitate toward Donald because he knew he would find a responsive, uh, educated, erudite um, counterpart there. I, I, I mean, there were lots of other things that drew them together, but I think it was that attraction of, of intellect and, and uh, erudition. They were good friends. That's interesting. I didn't know that. I, I don't remember Mishima having mentioned Donald Ritchie, and I, I, nor do I remember, I, I guess I do remember a few nasty sweet Donald Ritchie remarks about Mishima over the years, but yeah. I, I didn't know yeah. that they had an actual association, you know, because they really would have been a little wary, I think, of each other, well, given that they were both. But John, another thing that in a sense connected them very well, I think, was that they were both, or each of them, in his own separate way, was putting on an act constantly. They were yeah. posing, they were pretending, they were they were uh, poseurs. And while they were posing and putting on performances, 
I think they were both, maybe especially Donald, very much uh, interested in authenticity and, and getting whatever they could find in terms of authenticity in their relationships with other people. Well, they were both simulating normalcy. Is the yeah. Way I, yeah. You, you know, they're, they're both pretending to be normal. Guys like yeah. you and me, which they really weren't. So that's, it, uh, that's in my head now. I'm, Proust, of course, was very important to Mishima as well. So man, I, I, I wish I knew more about what kind of an, did, um, did either of them ever write about the other? Donald wrote a number of essays about Mishima. Yeah. Did he? And if you, I, if you go back to the journals, uh, he did write quite a bit about, about Mishima. I've got to look that, I don't remember that. And Donald, as I recall from the journals again, which I was just rereading the other day, um, very early on in both their lives, um, Donald was first introduced to Mishima by Meredith Weatherby. Um, I think around 1951 or 52, Donald was a student then at Columbia. He left Japan to go and, and study um, at Columbia for three or four years. And Mishima was on his first trip to New York. And Meredith asked Donald to sort of show Mishima around, which he did. And, um, and they kept up their friendship for, for you know, years after that, right up until Mishima's death. I just wanted to interject for a moment and um, add a couple of points about the Inland Sea, which I noticed upon this third reading of it, um, which I enjoyed more than my first two, um, especially if you're on the fence about readings, it will constantly get better and better and better. It does get better and better. And you know, what's interesting, Peter, I also felt like reading at this time that so many of his observations, which might have seemed dated in the bubble years, 1980s, and maybe a little effete in the 90s, in the 21st century, when Japan is in a way being a little bit humbled by its own demographics, by its own deflation, by all these different factors, by China's rise, that the book actually, I almost reads better now than it ever did to me. It seems so acute and so funny. And one of the things I wanted to mention, if you're on the fence about buying this book, if you're interested in Japan or just interested in good writing and good prose and, and good prose about being an expat or an immigrant or finding another culture. You know, I mentioned The Enigma of Arrival, which is by V.S. Naipaul, who's an immigrant to England uh, from the Caribbean. Um, I, I highly recommend that book. And this book, I feel like, is in that same category. It's it's a little bit Wizard of Oz. It's it's a little bit, we're not in Kansas anymore. Uh-oh, what are we doing here? It's a little bit um, uh, picaresque in the old tradition of a rogue. You know, uh, Donald Ritchie often describes himself in the book as being, you know, this, you know, kind of barbaric white guy who's wandering around elegant, beautiful, restrained Japan, which most of us who've um, even myself with Japanese family, I often felt as a teenager, I was this roguish American kid running around a country where uh, people knew how to take care of their teacups and I didn't know what I was doing. Um, so he captures that and it's also incredibly funny. I don't know if you guys remember, there's a passage where um, Donald writes about being the American who's asked uh, all the time, like, what do Americans think of this? What do Americans think of that? What about Elizabeth Taylor? What does she look like? What does she really look like? Hey, you know, Jane Fonda, did she take her clothes off? And he's going, well, I, yeah, I, you know, and of course, as an American, and he writes in this beautifully heartbreaking, but very funny passage, he wants his uh, Japanese interrogators to focus on him as an American. So he says, well, actually, I don't know what America says. Some Americans might think this, some, you know, some Americans might support Trump, some Americans might not. It's like, but he wants them to focus on him. No, but no. they don't, they don't because his Japanese interrogators think you're American, we're Japanese, so you should be able to talk about America and tell us what Americans think. And he has this sort of, he ties himself in a knot 
because he's trying to say, no, I actually, I want you to focus on Donald. Like I'm, I'm not a rep of the country. When he says, I want you to focus on Donald, he means I want you to focus on Donald as a flesh and blood lover, as a person, as a person in myself, not as a representative of this country called America, because I don't represent anything. Exactly. But the passage ends up being very funny. Yeah. Because yeah. he uses, you know, he skips from dialogue to, to his internal feelings and he keeps trying to explain himself. And of course, there's a group of Japanese boys who are looking at him like, what's wrong with you? Like, what, why can't you answer the question? <laughs> and he keeps trying to qualify everything he's saying. And it's just one of the moments in the book where I also realized, you know, this book is very funny. It's very self-deprecating. It's richness in terms of the emotional range and the, the, the storytelling, what you want out of a great storyteller, somebody who can, can shift, you know, has a capacious emotional range, but also has a kind of wisdom. Uh, and I, of course, it reminded me that this book was published in 1971 before Said's Orientalism was uh, widely disseminated and before uh, cancel culture became such a thing in the United States. Some of Donald's generalizations right now I'm sure people would find offensive in some ways. You know, he says the Japanese do this, they think this way, they behave this way. And I'm sure a reader in 2021 might balk at that. But at the same rate as a writer, you know, I've always felt like my first job is to, is to entertain. It's to write a good story, to create character, to, to provide a voice to carry a reader into another realm and other emotional territory. And um, sometimes, you know, Donald's work reminds me you have to take risks to do that. You have to, you have to take, if you don't take those risks, then it's just drivel. It's um, everything's mild mannered and polite and you don't really penetrate conscience or um, culture. Well, I mean, did, that, that was my feeling reading the book now, I guess. I think he took every possible risk that a writer can take, and he did it with just impeccable honesty. Um, what I come away with from reading the journals, the, the Inland Sea, his other writings, is this guy, he may be putting on poses, he may be pretending to be this and pretending to be that, but he's doing it with incredible honesty. If you read him carefully, it's so authentic and so, so honest. You know, I, I, I wasn't going to talk about this, but I have to share one anecdote with you on that subject. When, when I was at Weatherhill and we were working on the final stages of the Inland Sea before it went to press, most of the love affairs, of which there are many in the book, um, were affairs or encounters with women. And it was making all of his editors and all of us very uncomfortable because it, it didn't ring with authenticity somehow. And so finally, I forget who it was. It certainly wasn't me because I was too shy to say anything like this. But somebody in the group said, come on, Donald, tell it straight. They were all guys. Most of them were guys, these people you were taking back to your inn and, and going to bed with or whatever. They weren't pretty young girls. Some of them may occasionally have been, but they weren't, for the most part, they were guys. And Donald said, as though, you know, with a great sense of relief on his part, yes, you're absolutely right. Let's go with the truth. And he rewrote those passages and made them men. Um, that was a great awakening for me, certainly as a young as a young editor. And I think that kind of honesty pervades all of his writing. There's uh, one passage in the Inland Sea that I had forgotten about, maybe conveniently, over the years that I highlighted in this most recent reading. And I have to thank Peter and, and Michael Palmer at Stonebridge for providing me with the latest edition of the book. But um, there's a passage where he's writing about great expatriate literature. And, you know, 
obviously 1920s, the left bank, Paris, and you know, the writers who have traveled the world and written great books around the world. And you, you know, Peter, you talk about brutal honesty. He points out that Japan has not produced a lot of great expatriate literary writing. Hmm. And he, he wonders aloud in print, and I mean, you think of this as 1971, he wonders aloud if it's because that there's something uh, in modern Japan, obviously we're talking about post-World War II, modern Japan, that actually kind of makes living life so pleasant and so graceful and so elegant and so um, civilized that the great challenges and conflicts that drive world literature just aren't there in your daily life if you're an expatriate living in Japan. He doesn't come to a conclusion. He wonders if someone of his caliber, someone of his dreams and ambitions in Japan loves living there but might not produce the kind of, you know, the Dostoevsky's, the, the you know, the, the, the great literature of the world. Mm. And it's incredibly vulnerable. Reading that passage now, I was like, wow, he was so naked. Mm. And being able to say in 1971 in his 40s, like, I love this place. I'm unabashedly seeking what I believe is essentially Japanese, however absurd that might be in any country, in any culture. I'm unabashedly in love with this place. I can't imagine living anywhere else. It fits me, it suits me, and it might not be very good for my literary aspirations, <laughs> which I thought was just so, you know, you talk about honesty. It's like, wow, this guy in 71 is saying, geez, um, I'm writing a, what is yeah. arguably a great yeah. book, but I don't know if this is the best place to produce remember, uh, a world-beating novel. Remember, he was always coming back to the point that he wasn't Japanese, that he was an American, he was an expatriate living in this marvelous, whatever uh, society, however he described it, he was not part of it. And he also said quite often, if I were Japanese, I'd get out of here in 10 minutes. Um, which is the other side of the coin, which I think is also very perceptive. Perceptive. You know, the book that I wish Donald had written, listening to all of this, and to what Roland's just been saying, um, and I don't think he did write it, would have been Donald's sort of city of night a la John Ritchie or something. You, know, you remember these, if you ever walked around Bueno, with him, you know, every porn movie ticket vendor and pimp, and I would bow to him, and they would say, you know, since it all, you know, and he would he and, and he and he liked to he called himself Mr. Paul, as I remember, Paul says it, yeah, don't know, don't know. and and where it was like, and he went deeply into this sort of underbelly culture. Of Japan, and he loved it, and he rejoiced it, and he fabulized it, and he, you know, made it into a game. And that, if he had written that book, that might have been his greatest book about Japan, as far as I'm concerned. I would love if he had done it, just pulled that curtain back, and told because you, you know how he used to love. He would talk about the Aveku cafes. I say you can go in, and you can have a cup of coffee and a pea, and you can see this amazing theater going on all around you and he would love, and then he would, then, oh, it's Mr. Paul has come to join <laughs> us. And Don said, yes, and we'll pull, pull the snow and we'll try to And John, that, John right? I'm kind of glad he never wrote that John Ricci sort of book. <laughs> I'm really glad he didn't write it. Um, Why is that? I loved, what I loved was when he would take very, very proper um, intellectual ladies from Britain or from New York and drag them through the back streets of um, Kabukicho, for example, in, in Shinjuku, and almost forcefully force them 
to witness these things about underbelly Japan that he found so wonderful that he knew would totally offend them. <laughs> they, they would go running back to international oh, yeah. or wherever they were staying, just so mortified that they'd been forced to witness certain things that Donald found so fascinating. That was up what I meant by the epate of la bourgeoisie. <laughs> really, he really loved doing things like that. Well, you. I, I think it. I think it. Just one more point I'd like to add. I think it also maybe. Um, it, it there may be something revealed in the fact that Donald Ritchie wrote the book when he was in his forties. Um, so he wasn't a kid, but he wasn't yet in his late middle aged. He wasn't established as, you know, this film critic yet. There's a freshness and an openness to his prose in that book that you don't always see in Donald's writing. And it was struck me again that he, he in the book, he refers back to uh, General MacArthur's very unfortunate and offensive comment about the Japanese, um, which was, you know, uh, utterly displayed his ignorance, but also his impatience with the Japanese that, you know, these people have the, the I think what he says, the sensibility or the mind of the 12 year olds. Um, MacArthur said that, and it was, uh, I don't think we should forget that. Uh, despite some of the smart things he did, he was a, a, a racist and a, a, a bigot. But at the same time, it's interesting that Donald, reminds us of that phrase and he adds to it. No, actually he said, the, um, in his mind, the ideal Japanese is about 18 years old and combines the, <laughs> the best part of innocence. You know, when you're 18, you've still got good limbs, you've still got energy, you've still got vision with the newfound strengths of experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was striking. Again, you know, if you read it the wrong way, it sounds like another racist, idiotic phrase. And, you know, it, it has its own hangups and whatever. But at the same time, when I was reading the book this uh, most recently, I thought, you know, Donald was at this interesting point in his life where he was in his 40s. He started taking notes on the Inland Sea much earlier, but was cobbling together these diaries and producing a narrative at a point in his life where he was still romantically innocently, deeply in love with Japan. And at the same time had the experience of reading, of travel, of knowing Japanese, uh, the geography of Japan, the history of Japan and his own cultural heritage at a point when maybe these things just coalesced quite beautifully in this particular book, The Inland Sea. And I don't mean the other books aren't worth reading but we're talking about that book tonight. And I think rereading it now is my third time. I thought, this is a really magical book. I mean, it, 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 his voice, his intuition, his risk-taking, you know, not only in, uh, uh, psychologically, but as a stylist, like I told you, the, the present tense, the past tense, these, these camera switches where it's like, wow, this is not an easy thing to do. You know, to go from from uh, you know dialogue to past tense to a memoir voice to here's Saburo right in front of me, in the doorway, that you know that takes some skill to pull off. You can sound pretty amateurish if you don't know what you're doing. And Donald knew what he's he knows what he's doing in this. What he's doing, and um, I don't think that ever ended. I showed you a picture of Donald in 2012 when he was 87 years old. Um, it was still the same Donald that was the Donald who wrote the Inland Sea. He may have acquired more layers of, I don't know, sophistication, wisdom, whatever experience, but he was still always looking for that, whatever it is, that essential innocence that he valued so much uh, in Japan, that sort of essential purity. Um, so I don't think Donald ever lost the quality that you were talking about right up to the end of his life. Um, Yuko-san, how are we doing on time? Is, I mean, this has been marvelous fun uh, going on and on. Um, 
talking among the three of us. But um, yes, uh, I think I need to stop you because I think the three of you could be talking for another three hours if I don't intervene here. But um, we do have a couple of questions. I'm not too sure if you'll be able to cover all of it, but I am going to start one that is um, quite personal. So there's a question that says, hope this is not too personal, but Donald told me that when he died, he wanted his, at his ashes scattered over the Inland Sea. I wonder if this happened. Do you know if this actually happened? You know, I should know that. And I'm sorry to say that I don't. Um, I don't. I, I would be delighted to be told that that's what happened with his ashes, but I really, I really don't know. Maybe there are people in the audience um, who, who do know. Wonderful. And there's a couple questions about the different uh, writings that he's done. There's one that says, I always read with great interest anything that Donald wrote about music. Do any one of you know um, um, about his own personal musical life? Meaning what he listened to or what he I played? Think both what he listened to, um, his association with music. Did he play music? He played music all the time. He listened to, and as I said earlier, he tended to listen to many more obscure pieces of music than one might expect. Um, um, but he he organized concerts, some public, some private concerts. He knew many Japanese musicians. Uh, he loved Takemitsu as a composer. And one of, one of Donald's um, closest early friends uh, was the composer, the film composer, Hayasaka Fumio, who was a teacher of, of uh, Takemitsu's, if Takemitsu had teachers, but Hayasaka uh, was the person who brought Donald first to Kurosawa and to other uh, celebrities, figures in the Japanese film world, who Donald later wrote about. But uh, I do know that Hayasaka was a very, very close friend, and there was great mutual respect between the two of them. Um, but another aspect of Donald's that has to do with music, he was also very interested in the collaboration of music and dance, music and physical moment, movement. He, um, quite late in his career, he was very delighted to be asked to choreograph certain pieces for the Tokyo Star Ballet Company, which was not an attribute that you'd expect from Donald Ritchie, but he had a lot of fun doing that ballet choreography. So the combination of music and movement was something that appealed very much to him. And, and he was very sensitive, of course, to film music and how music should be used in films and how it shouldn't be used in films. Um, many times he would criticize films that others would consider great masterpieces of film for terrible choices of music on the part of the, on part of the director. Very interesting. Um, actually, John, we have a question specific to you. Were you close to Donald over the years in the literally social circles or encounters that you wrote extensively about in Living Carelessly in Tokyo and elsewhere? Did you ever I'm, collaborate with Donald? I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. What, what, so I think it's talking about your book, Living Carelessly in Tokyo and Elsewhere. And I think the question is, uh, uh, the person asking is curious if you knew Donald while you were writing that and um, was he a part of the social circles that you write about in your uh, Living Carelessly in Tokyo and Elsewhere? Well, I mean, I wrote that book re relatively recently. I think it's maybe eight years ago or so. So my, my whole history with Donald, which was intermittent to be sure, was over. So uh, of course I knew him as I'd known him, and then I wrote that book, and I, um, I'm not sure I'm answering the question appropriately. I'm not sure what you're question getting is, at. I, I, of course, I knew Donald when I wrote that book. I don't think I wrote a lot about Donald in that book, 
Did I you think ever... there were times when Donald and I were on the outs, I remember vaguely. I think he was angry at me at some point. Everybody has been angry at me at some, some, some point or another. And I'm not sure why, uh, but we got back together for sure. And the last 30 years or so, I remember that we had a very nice, close relationship. Um, did you ever collaborate with him in, in your writing work? I never collaborated, but I appreciated his critical commentary on pieces of fiction that I sent him more than I appreciate anyone else who ever read my stuff. I, I think I said last time I considered Donald kind of to be my only teacher that I've ever had. Uh, I, I'm somebody who didn't have teachers mostly, but Donald wrote these amazing things uh, about stuff that I sent him to read. And I, I think he liked what I, I wrote, um, and, uh, but he would say things like, this doesn't work because you're being apologetic about it. I have a long letter from Donald uh, telling me about a, a half of a novel that I had sent him, which I actually threw away eventually. Uh, and he said, you know, Tanizaki never apologized, uh, but you're apologizing. And I, that just, you know, he was so true. It just changed the entire way that I was able to look at my own writing. And that's the kind of critic Donald was. I mean, if he cared about you at all, and he took the time, he could be so incisive about directions that you should go or things that you weren't seeing that it was absolutely marvelous. Wonderful. Actually, uh, somebody in our audience is sharing that Donald's ashes are indeed in the Inland Sea. Good. Oh. Wonderful. Oh. Wonderful. Uh, we are we are running out of time. I'm, I hate to say that this is actually one of the um, last questions that I'll be asking, but I thought it might be a good question to ask in terms of moving connecting Donald and to the future. And also Peter, I know you are a big advocate of the film. So um, is there anyone to your knowledge who has picked up where Donald left off in contributing in a meaningful way to Japanese film and cinema after he has passed away? Wow, that's a challenging question. I can't think of anyone who who is, I'm using this in a risky way, who is worthy of wearing the mantle of Donald Ritchie, which is not to say that there aren't people who've written very wonderfully about Japanese film, um, people who've done marvelous jobs of subtitling Japanese films, but I can't think of anyone who has the the breadth of experience and the personal relationships with um, so many different Japanese film directors as, as Donald did. Um, I may be overlooking someone very wonderful out there, but I can't think of, of anyone who's really Donald's successor in this field. Well said, Peter, yeah, I would agree with you. I think that is a wonderful way to end. And one of our participants have actually voiced it very wonderfully by saying, terrific conversation about a legend. And um, I think Peter, what you just said, we'll leave it there. You don't know anybody who can, who has continued the work of a legend and, and thus Donald um, is a legend. Um, well, Thank if I could, so if I could, if I could add one more comment, I have a terrible time reading and comprehending all the messages that come through on chat. But one that I did see that I really would like to uh, to mention, and, and it sounds very self congratulatory, and I don't mean it that way at all. But Lisa Lowitz, whom I have enormous respect for, as the editor of the Don Ritchie Journals. Um, just wrote about how much she appreciated this evening and how it brought Donald back to life uh, for her. Um, I would suggest to everyone, uh, remember the name Lisa Lowitz, and after you read The Inland Sea, 
The next book by Donald you should read is the one she edited, the Donald Ritchie Journals, I think, which will shed so much light on this incredible man's personality. Um, there, let me just leave it at that. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists and a equally big thank you to all of you who have joined us tonight. Um, um, with that said, I hope to see all of you again in our future programming online or in person. Thank you all. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everybody.